Okay, I think we'll start. So um, everybody is in, I think. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Enda Guinan, and I'm the Digital Communications Manager at Sarcoma UK. And you're all extremely welcome to this, which is the second in our series of Zoom chats about all matters sarcoma in July, which is Sarcoma Awareness Month. Uh, last week we talked about sarcoma and women's health, and today we're joined by four guests, two oncologists with considerable experience of clinical trials, and two people who, as patients, have participated in clinical trials. It should be a fascinating 45 minutes, and uh, as well as talking to the four panellists, we welcome your questions as well, and I'll tell you how to do that in a moment. I've just got a few pieces of housekeeping to get through. Um, the webinar is being recorded um, so that we can share it uh, afterwards for people who can't make it tonight. Now, your details won't be on the recording uh, unless you ask a question and we spotlight you. If you don't want your, if you are called upon and you don't want that to be part of the recording afterwards, just let me know. I'll put my email in the chat and you can just let me know that and we'll cut it out. Um, just so that you're completely relaxed about taking part fully tonight. So don't worry. Okay, so some of you will have taken part in Zoom meetings before and some of you will have taken part in webinars. The basic things to know are we, the hosts and the panelists can't see you or hear you. So if you would like to ask a question, there are a couple of ways to do that. The first way is you can type your question into either the chat box below or the Q&A box. Either one, you'll see them. Uh, secondly, there's also a little um, thing there about raise your hand. If you raise your hand, we'll come to you. Now, we'll try to keep the questions until the end of the session or towards the end of the session. But if you have a, an urgent question and if you feel that it might be good to address that as the meeting is in progress or as the panel is in progress, put up your hand and we'll, we'll go to you and spotlight you. Okay, your host this evening is my colleague Bradley Price, who is the Policy and Public Affairs Manager at Sarcoma UK. Uh, if you were on our social media channels today, you might have seen him. He is the presenter of Milestones, which is the first in our, um, our uh, video series about uh, policy wins over the past 10 years and that's sarcoma.org.uk forward slash milestones and in a moment i'll hand over to bradley but i want to tell you a little bit about our four uh, panelists tonight so our first panelist is jane lockery and jane was diagnosed with gist in 2016 and following surgery she took part in a clinical trial to assess and develop the new drug avapritinib I always struggle with that one. Without avapritinib, Jane's sarcoma will return. Now, if you again, if you were following the social media today, you would have seen Bradley in Milestones, but you also have seen Jane. So we are very lucky to have her tonight, who will be able to share her first-hand experience of being a patient on a clinical trial. Dirk Strauss then is a consultant surgical oncologist and general surgeon in the sarcoma unit and skin unit at the Royal Marsden. Many of you may know him. He has a special interest in surgery for limb, retroperitoneal and intra-abdominal sarcomas. Uh, Dirk is the National Coordinator for the STRAS study into radiotherapy for retroperitoneal sarcomas. He participates actively in clinical trials within the UK and Europe and has principal and sub-investigator roles within the Royal Marsden Sarcoma Unit. Sarcoma UK was very pleased to give the Roger Wilson Research Award to the STRAS2 study the first trial of its kind to investigate the impact of chemotherapy on high-risk sarcoma patients before surgery. So a big welcome to Dirk. Emily Travis described herself as, quote, wife, mum, runner, swimmer, scientific communication specialist, joke lover, and unwilling cultivar of a hardcore relationship with stage four cancer, leiomyosarcoma. Emily was told in 2014 that she wouldn't be around in 2015 and that was not to be the only time that she would be given this prognosis. She was accepted onto a clinical trial where she would receive double therapy with chemotherapy, as well as a new targeted treatment that was being evaluated. Her treatment at London's Royal Marsden meant lengthy fortnightly trips, including a 5 a.m. start, and sometimes she'd be still there at 9 p.m. in the evening. And we'll share a link to a podcast that Emily did for us a couple of years ago as she documented a particularly grueling day. And we're extremely grateful that she's here tonight. 
Dr. Shani Zaidi is a consultant clinical oncologist specializing in the treatment of sarcoma and skin cancers at the Royal Marsden also. After his postdoc in molecular medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, Dr. Zaidi took on a role in the sarcoma unit and is now actively involved in clinical research. He has a particular interest in integrating new treatments, including immunotherapy, into radiotherapy treatments for sarcomas, and we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing about some of the trial work that he's involved in at the moment. So a big welcome to our guests and uh, welcome to you all again also. And I'm now going to hand over to Bradley. Thank you very much, Ender. And uh, I'd like to put another warm welcome out from myself to, to everyone here. It's great to see so many people interested in clinical trials. So we're going to start off right at the very beginning. Shani, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know what is a clinical trial and what does it mean for patients? Actually, thank you very much for the invite again. So I suppose um, the important thing is that uh, clinical trials really are uh, the pretext to developing um, new treatments or techniques really to, to check if that treatment or technique is safe and works better than our current treatments. Um, and there are different kinds of trials. That, um, certainly we have been um, um, demonstrating um, in healthcare medicine for a while now. Um, there are trials where we either observe what's happening to a group um, of our patients, these are observational studies, and then the trials that we tend to be a little more interested in are the interventional trials, where we're really looking at a specific treatment, putting patients into different groups, um, so researchers can essentially compare results, um, looking at both safety and how effective they are. And certainly, um, you know, there is a real, I think in sarcoma, there is a need to continue to expand on our existing portfolio of clinical trials um, to really to be able to improve results. Because as we know, um, once patients, unfortunately, if they develop advanced disease, um, you know, even though our existing treatments have, have demonstrated there is some improvement in quality of life, we really need to do better. Um, and that, that really is a summary of existing clinical trials and how we can kind of look to improve things. Thank you. And could you let us know about some of the trials that you're involved in at the moment at the master? Absolutely. So, I mean, first it's worth, I mean, it's worth mentioning that obviously, you know, the Marsden is just one out of, I think, 16 or 17 units. So we've got trials nationally and internationally, but certainly we've got a very large portfolio of trials um, across both surgery, um, systemic therapy, so chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiotherapy and imaging. Um, there are currently 20 trials that are open, eight that are soon to open, and 21 that are follow up. The trials that I'm personally involved in um, are really reflect my interest in combining radiation with biological agents. So one of the studies is the Apple study, which certainly some of our patients um, have been very keen to participate in. Um, essentially, patients with uh, cancer, sarcomas that have spread to the lungs, um, the standard of care is either chemotherapy or, or radiation. And my interest is combining radiation with immunotherapy, new drugs like um, what we call checkpoint inhibitors, a uh, drug specifically called Evalumab, to see if we can improve the outcome of using radiation alone. Um, another study that we're looking at is called the PREDICT study, and that really is looking at combining three studies in one, trying to see if the patients who are receiving radiotherapy with surgery, uh, just prior to surgery, can we actually collect information to see how those patients are doing? And that involves patient questionnaires, looking at uh, um, patient-related outcomes, which is really important. We're also pairing that with imaging, scans and biopsies, so collecting tissue to see if we can actually predict not only who's going to respond to radiotherapy, but maybe if we could identify patients who may um, um, develop uh, advanced from a disease later on, allowing us to maybe change our treatments. Um, and it's important that, you know, with respect to all of these trials, it's really collaboration across um, multiple units within the Marsden and outside as well. So working with people like um, Matt Blackledge, Christina Masu, um, Andrew Hayes, and the Institute of Cancer Research colleagues. Fantastic, thank you. And yeah, collaboration is it's absolutely important. Hopefully we'll come on to that a little bit later, if that's okay. But um, I'd like to go to Emily now, if that's quite all right. And you can tell you someone who's been treated at the Royal Marsden, I believe, about your experience of having been on one of these trials. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I guess uh, one of the things uh, Ender mentioned at the beginning is that uh, I was on a uh, trial right at the beginning. Um, uh, so, so with sarcoma, you start off having surgery always, um, and then when things spread too much, uh, tend to move on to clinical trials, and that's when I moved to the Marsden. Um, the first trial I was on was a phase three, uh, which um, involved a what they call a pharmacokinetic element, where they basically, if you've ever looked at the, the your drug package insert, there's a 
there's a little graph in there which shows how the drug is released. And basically to do that, they need to me measure your blood every other day. Um, so from a purely patient perspective, it meant um, I had to be at the Marsden every other day for 60 days. Uh, and I live two and a half hours away from the Marsden. So as a patient, um, it had quite a substantial impact but I was on a drug that was brand new, um, coupled with a much older sarcoma drug. Um, and I ended up staying on that trial into that. So you're on this kind of properly controlled element for quite a while where the clinicians are seeing you very, very regularly. And then after that, it goes into an extension phase. Um, and I stayed on that drug for at least another year and a half, um, which considering my prognosis was pretty incredible. Since then, um, I've been involved in two other clinical trials. So the first one was a pharmaceutical sponsored study. And the second one uh, was a academic study based uh, at the Marsden. And then I've been on another academic study as well with immunotherapies. Um, unfortunately, nothing uh, worked for me. Uh, but I think that's one of the things about being on a phase one study is uh, that, you know, you sign up knowing that actually um, this is very, very much the experimental stage. Um, and uh, I think we'll probably come on to this later. There are very few options for sarcoma patients. Um, so you, you do end up being offered more phase ones. Um, and I was offered another phase one at the start of the pandemic, but unfortunately that didn't go ahead. Um, so yeah, so my, my experience has been positive on the whole, but the impact in terms of your actual sort of physical well-being and traveling um, is, is quite substantial and something to think about when you um, first consent to a clinical trial. But um, I've, I have sort of nothing but positive things to say, even when you sign up and, and something doesn't end up working, um, actually the research team look after you very well and you won't be left on a drug for longer than you should be. Um, at the moment, I'm back on a very old sarcoma drug because it's the only thing that seems to kind of hold things steady for me. Um, there's a trial open that I could be offered, but it's, uh, 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 <laughs> I don't know how much explanation, I a double blind placebo control, which means that some patients get the active treatment, some patients get a placebo, um, and I'm considered too high risk to have a placebo at the moment. So, um, but that's another thing that the doctors will help support and discuss with you and the research nurses who are just unbelievably brilliant. So. I should probably stop now, Brad. No, that's great. Thank you very much. And if I can draw a slight parallel to Jane, who, uh, who's who been down to the Royal Marsden from Scotland, how did the two of you find the the regular travel, the, you know, the effort that it took to get down? Did you feel it was work? How it was going? Yeah. Um, I had to get the, I was up and got a taxi and I got the 705 flight to Gatwick, Gatwick Express, etc. Um, got a CT scan done, got bloods done, took the tablet, um, went for my lunch and then came back, saw the doctor, then went and got my tablet's expenses and did the return journey. It bit off a total day, but it was worth it. Um, oh, it, it was. And I kept saying to myself, it's, this is a good move, this is positive. Just um, I was always scared that I'd sleep in and the taxi driver would wake me up. <laughs> but... Yeah, it was it was worth it on a bit of hassle I won't, I'll be on a bit of hassle but it was so worth it because I got my a trial drug I was on I've printing it worked for me um and I can't sing its praise anymore anymore but but yeah um I'm back at the beach soon which is in Glasgow 20 miles from my house it's half an hour in the car so much easier, but worth it for the travelling all in all. Well, um, yeah, but at the beach, and um, like today I got my scan and then two weeks I have to go and get my bloods and then on the third I have to see the doctor. So it's like three appointments and um, and I'm self-employed, so that's a loss in, loss in work. But uh, I'll do what is, what is the routine and what the beats and do, but doing everything on the one day, was just brilliant. Like, you know, it suited me. Um, and then Emily mentioned about uh, a phase one trial being stopped because of the pandemic. Dirk, if, you, if I could bring you in now, just how have you seen the, the pandemic affect clinical, uh, clinical trials? Um, I think it affected it on several ways. Um, firstly, uh, when everything started off uh, in 2020 in the UK, 
Um, a, a lot of the trials were, were, were just closed. All trials were closed or stopped at that stage, especially the trials that involved um, chemotherapy because of the concerns they had about the uh, effect on the immune system. Um, I think gradually we started to adapt to it um, in terms of uh, doing surgery. We learned how to do surgery within a pandemic. We learned how to, to cope better with the pandemic. Um, most of the trials have now been back and, and running. So I think it's been with us for a year and a bit now. It's going to maybe be for, with us for a bit longer. So we have to learn how to, to still continue with treatment of cancer within a pandemic. We cannot neglect cancer patients and focus all our energy on pandemics. It has to, we have to refocus and learn how to do trials and do normal cancer care within a pandemic. Absolutely. And um, one of the trials which is which is getting going now is the, the STRAS2 trial for which you're the, uh, the UK national coordinator. Can you tell us a little bit more about STRAS2 and what it's trying to achieve? Yeah, my, my involvement in trials are slightly uh, maybe earlier than uh, what we've heard so far. So um, I'm involved more in this aspect of where we um, have patients that is in a curative uh, where they initially present and we know what the standard treatment will be for those patients. Um, and having looked at, after these patients for many years, we know what is the outcome and the results of our standard surgical treatment. And then we do trials to add treatment to our standard surgical treatment to see if that improves the outcome overall. Um, so the STRAS2 study, which implies there was a STRAS1 study, which I'll come to now, but the STRAS2 study specifically um, looks at patients with high grade retroperitoneal um, leiomyosarcoma and de-differentiated liposarcoma, where we know that despite um, successful surgery, a large proportion of these patients will still develop metastatic disease in the following years. So the study basically is a randomized control study where half of patients will get standard treatment, so surgery alone, and the other half of the patients will have new adjuvant, so initial chemotherapy, um, followed by surgery after the three cycles of chemotherapy. So um, to see if the new adjuvant chemotherapy improves the long-term outcome of, um, of, of patients with the high-risk retroperitoneal sarcomas. Um, in the STRAS-1 study um, that finished a few years ago, we um, again looked at patients with retroperitoneal sarcomas and there we combined um, radiotherapy in a preoperative setting um, to our surgery. So again, half the patients um, had uh, radiotherapy and then surgery and the others had just standard treatment, which was just surgery alone. And we looked at the outcome. So my focus are mainly on, on patients where we are still in a curative uh, setting and we see if if we add adjuvant or additional treatment to our standard surgical treatment, whether there's an improvement in outcome in the future. Yeah, it's interesting because I think a lot of people think that sarcoma treatments, when you're looking at clinical trials, it's more about the evolution of, of what we already have and improving it to make it better rather than revolution. I don't know if you'd like to come in here as well, Shani. Have you seen any breakthroughs uh, in, in sarcoma treatment? in the last decade or so? Yeah, um, so I think it's interesting because they've been, I think there have been breakthroughs um, um, different, depending on how you define a breakthrough, um, but certainly I would say, you know, from surgery, radiotherapy, um, from different tumor types, there's been several breakthroughs. I suspect um, it's worth mentioning that up until about 2007, we only had about three drugs um, and before Dirk says this, um, you know, our standard first line drug has been the one that we've been using, you know, Dr. Rubison, I call it, since 1974. So it hasn't really changed. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've gone on to have several new drugs, uh, Trebectin, Pizopin, and Gemcitabine. Um, landmark studies that I think are interesting um, in, in, in the advanced setting, the EORTC 6212 study, which Ian Judson was leading on, essentially asking the question, we've got two drugs, I fast my Dr. Rubison, if we combine them together, um, for patients who have incurable disease but, uh, rather than giving one, is that better? And essentially the short answer is um, it doesn't improve survival. However, if you're looking to uh, improve what we call response rate to basically try and get, get more patients to benefit from chemotherapy, I think the numbers were 25% in the um, getting both drugs versus 
15, 14 percent, then, then, then yes, you can get a more rapid response, but that is at the cost of more side effects. So it gave us an indication as to how to use that um, combination better. Um, in GISTs, um, and certainly Jane, I think you, 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 you'll be a testament to this, we know that there have been some good studies looking at some of the newer drugs, so imatinib was, was the first targeted agent back in 1999-2000, um, the first magic bullet, um, and since then, we've had you know lots of new agents. Avapritinib, which I have always had difficulty, difficulty spelling, let alone saying. I call it happy pill. Happy pill, yeah. The blue, the blue disc studies have shown there's been remarkable responses approaching ninety percent. So that's been you know interesting. Um, and then I think it's just worth mentioning you know some of the smaller rather than these large phase three studies, we've moved to looking at smaller studies in, in, in sarcoma. So rather than treating this as one large um, bulk of um, all comers, we're looking at subtypes. So we know, al you know alveolar soft part sarcoma, we've got some good therapy, sedinirib is another study that um, is, a, is a, what we call a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, some really good responses. Um, um, we've got another subtype called epithelioid um, sarcomas, no, no standard therapy up until two years ago when tazemetostat was approved as, as the first line treatment. Um, and just taking one step back, and maybe Dirk will come on to this, although we've talked about, you know, revolutionary kind of landmarks, I think it's worth taking a step back and saying, not only does that, not only have we de delivered on some good studies, we've also actually found that the process of um, collaborating has allowed us to, um, you know, get an appetite for international collaboration. And maybe Dirk, you want to talk about um, studies on yeah. platforms like EORTC, and particularly the TWOPS group, because that's shown that we can actually collaborate better to get better protocols. I think... Um... For someone that has been here for more than a decade, um, the, the big breakthroughs I think over the last decade or more uh, in sarcoma has been uh, specialist centers, people treated in units that deals with sarcomas a lot, that uh, made a big difference. I think um, people being treated with spe by specialists that understands the disease better. And then a lot of the early studies, we took sarcomas as a big group of diseases and put them together in a basket and they gave, got the same chemotherapy. While I think with the evolution of care and more um, specialist units, we see more and more that it's a whole family of completely different diseases. And that the trials now starts to focus much more on subtypes and even types within subtypes um, to make sure that it, it is, it is specifically targeted at specific disease patterns. Um, we, it, 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 is, it makes the, the management of the disease a lot more attractive, but it makes it also more difficult because if you start looking at types within subtypes, you struggle to find enough patients to do trials. So that's why international collaboration is so important, where we now do trials for instance, the STRAS2 study is done uh, across Europe, the UK, um, Australia, Canada, the US. So we will have all the international centers participating in, in the trials. And therefore, we are so much better at recruiting the, the right patients for the right trials to try the right drugs. Um, and all of them are treated by specialists. So I think that that has been a, a big change over the last decade in sarcoma care. Absolutely. And the more patients you have, the better the data, the hopefully more likely it is that that will be approved if it is a, a biological treatment that needs to be approved by the medicine regulator, whichever country you're in. So it's so important. I wanted to come touch lightly on funding as well, because, you know, everyone wants to <laughs> look of look of fear, which is fantastic. But, uh, you know, every, we I think we can all agree that we'd like to see more trials and we'd like to see more going on. But funding often is a stumbling block for a lot of these uh, potential trials. Um, in June, Sarcoma UK said they would contribute £50,000 towards the STRAS2 trial. Could you talk a bit about why funding is important and how that funding will help? Um, as um, Shani said before, the, the drugs that we currently, or that is used in the STRAS2 study are very well established drugs. So they're not new drugs. Where you have new drugs developing, you quite often get a large um, contribution from the pharmaceutical companies to, to, to help do the trials and the, uh, and the studies. But where you use established uh, drugs or established treatments like radiotherapy, there will be no funding except by the organizations doing the study. So um, both of these studies were EORTC sponsored studies which are extremely good and effective in treating or in, in organizing and setting up trials and running trials, but it does involve um, trial coordinators, uh, statisticians, 
people collecting samples, all these different components of every study. Um, all the biopsies have to be centrally reviewed, the tissue have to be sent to the laboratories, um, imaging has to be reviewed, um, outcomes and st statistics have to be collected and, 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 and research nurses have to be paid. So all those components have to be paid for. And where we do a, um, a kind of an academic study where we don't have any new drugs developing, the money has to be found by the sponsors of the study. So, for instance, the Struss uh, 2 study, there was no external fund or there was no funding from pharma. All the um, funding had to come from charities. So, uh, the um, a, a few European um, uh, uh, charities contributed, and then we were extremely grateful that Sarcoma UK also contributed um, a significant amount to the running of the UK component of the study. And, and the money will be used for um, co collecting the samples, transporting the samples, paying the research nurses, getting this. Um, there's a huge component of translational research to the study, so getting the samples to the to the labs getting the data back to the central um, headquarters, getting the imaging at, at the right time in the right place and, and, and supporting the, the research nurses. So it is absolutely essential. That was unfortunately another um, way how the pandemic interfered with research because all of a sudden there were no London marathons, there was no um, sports events that helped getting money together for charity. So I think the charities had a huge, uh, a huge knock from the pandemic in terms of getting their funding together. Absolutely, and we're incredibly grateful to everyone that has raised money for us to be able to continue funding as much of the, the research that, as we can. Just as a quick jargon buster, EORTC is the European Organization for the Research and Treatment of Cancer, for anyone that's not aware. Um, I want to talk a bit about patient access to trials. Emily, Jane, I don't know if you wanted to come in and, and say a bit about how you found your trials, how easy it was, and, and your recommendations for what to do. Um, shall I, can I start with that, Jane? Um, I, I guess for me, I, I was initially at a different hospital. I was at the Churchill for surgery, uh, and then the second surgery, um, and then when it got to the stage where I was going to be off as chemotherapy, um, I did quite a lot of research um, into uh, the clinical trials that were available, the drugs that were available, what was, uh, and I found a drug that was only available in America that was being trialed at the Marsden and self-referred across there. Um, but my background is such that it was quite easy for me to know where to look. Um, in hindsight, I think, you know, clinicaltrials.gov is a good place to look. But also your helpline is just brilliant for somebody who um, perhaps isn't as like good at reading that. I mean, clinicaltrials.gov is great, but it's full of jargon and letters and, and you know, you can just look at it till your the eyes go fuzzy. Um, and actually to ring the helpline, I think, is a really good place to start. Um, I also wrote to a patient organization in the US um, about when this drug that I was after was going to be available. Um, and when they would start trialing in which centers. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, my key thing is that you have to be proactive. Um, if you are perhaps at a major trial center on the right day in front of the right person, you might get offered uh, a trial. But if you have come in in a different route and you're not in front of a research nurse or research team, they might not automatically think of that. So um, yeah, picking up the phone to Sarcoma UK is a good place to start if you don't want to talk to anyone researching on clinicaltrials.gov um CRUK website's also fairly good but often not specific enough so I think that's that would be my suggestion um and you do have to drive it yourself somewhat so that we've posted the information about the support line in the chat so you can find it at sarcoma.org.uk forward slash support line or there's the email phone number and text number in the chat as well Jane, would you like to talk a little bit about how you um, came onto it? I was on the drug imatinib that did nothing to the tumour, and the tumour grew, regrew, and um, I kept regrowing. I am like the beats on the imatinib, and getting very stressed about it all. And then, um, no, whatever point in March two thousand and seventeen, um, Doctor Kelly said, "No, this is all good news," and I'm like what this tumour is growing and it's good news 
So once it got over 10 millimetres, um, the start, they then told me about the trial and um, everything, and I looked at it as well. Um, and then I went down to the Marston and asked them well, lots and lots of questions and then said, right, sign me up. It's cellular specific to the mutation I had. You know, and it just worked for me. I started in October and then by the end of November, I had cleared um, a three growths of over 10 millimetres and there be. Yeah. That's great. And that, that links, we just had a, a question in from Toby Firth and, and he says, I think this is perhaps best answered by everyone if possible. Do you think the onus is on patients to find the clinical trials? I know in Jane's case, that wasn't the situation, but also do you think that's fair? No, I think it should be offered to you. Um, yeah. I agree. I think it should be offered to you. I don't think that that often happens mm -hmm. um you know i i look at um relatives of mine who um that we, we 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 have a lot of cancer in the family and who have been at other smaller institutions and it doesn't it doesn't even cross their minds and it's me who's looking stuff up going try this do this and apply here you know um and it is i think um a sad but true fact that's um, I found, I mean, how long has it been for me now? Nearly nearly seven years, having been predicted to be three months. Um, but I think one of the, the reasons is that I'm incredibly proactive. I've had to have my arms just collapse because there's so much um, disease in it. And I've just had to have surgery. But it was me requesting the x-rays throughout because I'm now managed by six different hospitals and nobody has a handle on things as well as I do and that is just the way things are and that is not a criticism of the wonderful people who look after me but it's the way things are and it is the same I think for clinical trials if you're in the right place if you happen to have exactly the right inclusion criteria and be in front of the right doctor then absolutely they would mention it and include you that people aren't deliberately trying to exclude patients but I do think you need to take some of it on yourself, unfortunately. Before we move on to the medical professional uh, opinion, there's a quick question from Emily, uh, which says, or, and for Emily, which says, did you find it easy approaching your consultant about going on a trial? And did you still stay under your own consultant or did they take more of a backseat? Crikey, uh, who's my own consultant now? I, I, would, <laughs> uh, I would say my, my main consultant um, is uh, the sarcoma lead at the Marsden these days because I have been there for so long and he is the one that refers me in and out. My first um, main contact was a surgeon, weirdly a head and neck surgeon, although I had retroperitoneal cancer, I don't know why. Um, and um, so, so I never really had a person until moving to the Marsden. Um, uh, so so the, uh, I, I'm under Robin Jones and he is Mr. Clinical Trial. But anyway, so so he would always now consider me for anything eligible. And actually, we have a relationship now where there is uh, like this placebo controlled trial I mentioned where he contacted me about that. And he and I both strongly felt if I end up on placebo, my disease has to progress to such an extent, such a number of centimeters that I would be um, paralyzed and no longer alive before I was offered the drug. So there's no point. Um, but I have that kind of relationship with him now. Um, does mm -hmm. that answer your question? I guess he approaches me and the team approach me these days, um, but I find it very easy to talk to him, yes. Again, that's part of my background. I'm very quickly just to say my other advice to all the patients out there is just remember uh, people like Dirk and Shanae are people and you don't need to be afraid to ask your questions and be proactive and give your point of view because they will help support you in that. So. I think people find it difficult to approach consultants because they a little bit get the fear, perhaps. It, it I'll stop talking now. It, it depends also, uh, quite often the, the, the sarcoma trials will be done in different sarcoma units. So for instance, the, the, the STRAS2 study will be done in eight different sarcoma units across the UK. So um, it, it, 
there's pros and cons. Every unit that opens the study is extra cost, so it's cost a bit more. So the more units you have open, the more the more expensive the study will be. But um, you try to make it as accessible as possible for each patient and geographically as accessible as possible because it does involve a lot of travel and, and visits, as uh, Emily said. Um, so, however. Just because the, the study is not at your sarcoma center, you can still ask if there's a study applicable with the right inclusion criteria for you at a different sarcoma center. For instance, even in London, we would, there's two sarcoma units in London, we would not run all the studies at both centers. If it's if there's not many patients, then we will run it at one of the centers. So um, it is important to ask your sarcoma unit or your sarcoma consultant if there's maybe studies in other sarcoma units that may be applicable for you. I think just following on from you, Dirk, absolutely and echoing your points, Jane and Emily, it's all about having awareness. And that's not just awareness for patients, but awareness for clinicians. And, you know, you mentioned about the clinical trials database. That's fantastic. Sarcoma UK have a really good clinical hubs network, which I think is updated quite regularly. And that's really good access. Um, and then, you know, and, and then the final thing, as you said, was just picking up the phone, the number of emails that come to uh, my colleagues and then we get copied in, you know, um, you know, have you got anything else? Can we use this? I mean, you're right. You should be empowering our patients. I've been emailed um, through the clinical trial database regarding Apple study from patients. And, you know, it's our duty to obviously respond to that. You know, we are, like you said, we are here to be approachable. You know, we are working with our patients for our patients, actually. So, you know, it's about our patients first. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on a bit now to some of the other questions, if that's okay. I've got a question from James about PACE. So he says, given sarcoma is a rare cancer with low patient volumes, do clinical trials reach conclusions swiftly enough? That is uh, exactly why we're, where we have especially rare types of sarcomas in a study. Um, we have to do them over multiple units. So uh, international studies or trans um, uh, transatlantic or uh, all, all across the whole of Europe so that we have enough sarcoma centers involved that even if you have one or two cases a year that you have enough patients enrolled into the study so and that's why most of the, um, the sarcoma studies where you look at specifically the rare type of cancers will be over many many centers so that you can uh, recruit the same patients but in different uh, um, countries in different units and if I can take a slight bit of chair's prerogative, I think that the, the regulators that decide which medicines are available um, are more increasingly open to having data from an earlier stage of the trial. So we are hopeful that as they, they change their methodology to allow that, we will see the medicines coming through at a, an earlier stage than it otherwise would be. Uh, I've got a question from ABC Stewart. It says, um, is there an age bias as to who can be eligible for a trial? And what impact does, does that have? Are there enough trials for the younger populations? The, the paediatricians, um, Shani, you can talk about them. Um. Sure, no, you're absolutely right. We, I mean, there should not be an age bias in a clinical trial. The bias should never be age. It should be about um, whether the patient's firstly safe to enter and what's the right trial for them. Um, so although you know, there are lots of trials that are actually, I mean, Historically, when we, when we when we were writing protocols, we used to start off at 18 and say up to 65 or 70. But actually, we know that we can have some very, very fit 60, 70, 80 year old patients who are going to be fitter than our 40 year olds. So it's not really about age. It's really a discussion about um, how you're setting up the trial. So a lot of our trials are set up as investigator or academic studies where, when we're writing a protocol within the center. But there are other studies that are actually being written, written by the pharmaceutical companies. So we need to have a discussion. I think, you know, we have to have equipoise. All, all patients should have access to clinical trials trials. Um, in the paediatric setting, we, you know, we've got Julia Chisholm leading on lots of studies there. And certainly we've had to think about lowering the age group with some of our adult studies. Um, so I, you know, I'm guilty. I wrote a protocol and I put the cutoff at 18 um, arbitrarily. And I, and I learned that actually that wasn't the right thing. Um, and, you know, certainly when designing future studies, I will make sure that it's going to be inclusive. Um, we've gone to a new study and predict and that's the cutoff is going to be younger. Um, so it's not so much about age. It's about, um, I suppose, uh, you know, reserve. So we just need to make sure our patients are being, going to be well enough to tolerate some of these side effects, some of these procedures. Um, so it should really be all comers. The thing that tends to stop our patients really is about whether they're going to be fit enough um, or, or or actually well enough to travel those distances. Um, so that's really the key point here. Um, and certainly for new trials, for new medication, we just need to be careful that we're not going to be subject to them to undue risk and that they've got the reserves to be able to um, um, go through the process safely. 
when, when we set up studies, we have to present it to a research and ethics committee. And that's one of the first questions they ask you if you put an age limit to it, what is the reasoning behind age limit, either young or old? Um, there's no reason why you should stop it at 70 or 75 or 80 uh, or start it at 16. There's, there's no justification for that. You have to have inclusion criteria that yeah. fits the drug and the disease that you want to study. And I think age is less of a factor, but performance status is much more of an important factor. Exactly. I think we've learned that from the lung cancer population where there was, certainly when I was training, there was maybe a bias towards not including older patients. But actually, when you look at the data, older patients were doing really well, just as well, if not better than younger patients. So if anything, there was positive discrimination. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I would say are of more of an individual and personal nature. So I would say it's, it would be great if you could chat with the support line about those. But I think we've got time for one more question. So Tony has said, is there a pathway for specialist sarcoma centres to maintain liaison with regional hospitals and actively seek patients to be involved in clinical trials? And if so, what's, what, what's the criteria for those patients to be considered? It's a very good question. I mean, we, we should be... So one of the things that we were discussing is we should actually, um, you know, we have we have MDTs, we have MDTs within our, our unit talking about uh, discussing normal patients. But one of the things we were discussing is should we be actually setting up trial MDTs um, within a region for sort of patients who would actually be eligible? Um, and that's something that I think we need to explore. Um, unfortunately, it's always been a case of uh, somebody emailing somebody, picking up the phone. Um, and, you know, I think patients, there's been discussion about, um, as, as Emily said, about patients being able to self-refer and maybe you know, present their own cases, because so far, if a patient comes to me, I will say, well, that's fine. I, I think it's important to discuss this, um, but I just need to have some oversight from a clinician just to get some more information. But I know that, you know, Emily, you've been an example of somebody who's been very proactive to get that trial. Um, so, you know, I think it's a really, really good discussion, good point about how we can improve access and that may be a model that may be a model that we can think about. You know, disadvantages and advantages, obviously, but it's all about access. Um, also finding the time to have that specialist MDT. And, but, you know, it, that, that's what it's really about, is have, improving the links. And certainly in, during COVID, we've now learned that telemedicine is, is something that is here to stay. So we were all used to doing MDTs. Dirk, I can't remember the last time I saw you in MDT because we no, both sit now. We're not sitting together in the room anymore. We know each other no. on screen only. Um, exactly. So we know, exactly. Yeah, to add to that, the researchers and, and trial people that are running trials are very keen for patients to enter trials. We want patients to enter trials because we want to study the disease more. We want to improve outcomes. And I, I think patients do really well. They are well looked after in a study. They, are, they have so many people interested in them. They have scans. They have quality of life questionnaires. They have, they have a whole new aspect of care. So I think it is very encouraging to enter patients into study because I think patients are very well cared for in, 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 in research studies. Yeah. I would agree with that. Absolutely. I think, you know, you, you certainly have, because of the various kind of endpoints in the study, you have regular, uh, you know, physical checkups, you have um, lots of um, blood tests, you have regular scans, and they're protocolized. So you have to do everything. You know, there are no shortcuts. Not that we take shortcuts in normal medicine, but certainly, you know, we, we need to be very robust. And that's one of the advantages of going into clinical trials um, is, you know, um, it, it certainly, you, you, as, as our patients have said, you know, they, they have this direct access to our specialist nurses like Liz Barquin. <laughs> Yes, she's amazing. I, I'd absolutely agree. My, my first experience of um, being on chemo was being on a trial. And I think out of my last several years, I've probably been on trials two and a half years and the rest of it off trial. And there is a substantial difference um, from like a patient one -one perspective. Um, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it is, it, it's not something to you off i would say if you're considering entering the trial mm -hmm. i was three years at the marston and um, um, it was a delight to be there knowing that it was all positive and all the results were good and yes it was very enjoyable and yes i got looked after well yeah. mm -hmm. thank you both for taking part in these studies we're very grateful because you know mm -hmm. without our patients we can't do these trials Absolutely. And I probably wouldn't be here without them either, so, you know, <laughs> me <too. laughs> it benefits me too. <laughs> Seems like a very positive note on which to end, so I'll say a big thank you to our panel and for everyone for joining, and I'll pass you all back over to Ender. I think what, a, what an amazingly positive way to, to end. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank everyone for, for taking part. That was, uh, for, for me even, it was a very illuminating um, 
perspective on something that, you know, I, as someone who works for Sarcoma UK, I read about clinical trials and maybe I just see all the details and so on. But I think what was really important today was to see the very human side, both from uh, the patients who are saying this was a benefit to us and we're still here, and also from the clinicians, you know, that you are human beings and you can be approached and you can be asked questions and it's not anything to fear. And I thought that th those are my, my two big takeaways from this. Um, just to wrap up, uh, I see lots of compliments coming in, fantastic session and so on. I'd like to thank um, the, uh, everyone who asked questions. And as Bradley said, if uh, your question wasn't handled, um, please uh, get in touch with the support line. They'd be more than happy to, to, to talk to you about it. Um, so just to final, final notes, uh, a recording of this will be available tomorrow. So if you go to sarcoma.org, Dot uk forward slash 10 years that's where we have everything relating to both sarcoma awareness month and our uh, marking our 10-year anniversary as sarcoma uk but let me thank the absolutely superb panel uh, this evening to uh, jane lockery dirk strauss emily travis and shiny zady thank you very much bradley for hosting and thank you to everyone who came along we hope to see you uh, next week where we're going to be looking at the pretty exciting world of genomics um, and we're going to ask if genomics is the future of sarcoma treatment and I don't think that's one to be missed so we'll see you at 7 p.m. same time next week so thank you very much to everyone and have a lovely evening thank you thank you thank you very much everybody bye-bye